Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of... For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way.
All right, um, as Pastor said, our program today is entitled One Night in Bethlehem. We're going to actually start with the Bells Choir, and they're going to play through a couple songs. Some of you might not know the two songs that we're going to play. They're not sung in church as often as they used to be. So we, on the back of the program, you will find the words to these two songs. The first one's called Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates, and the second one's called Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. So we're going to have them come forward, and then we're going to continue into our program with both the children and the teens. And at the end of our program, um, if you see this uh, Christmas box that's wrapped right here, before uh, when pastor's done preaching and we're dismissed, if all the children and teens could come forward, we do have a small bag of Christmas candy that we wanted to give them on behalf of the church family. So let's get started with One Night in Bethlehem.
Luke 2, starting at verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. Luke 2, 4, and 5. Joseph went out from the city of Galilee, out to the city of Nazareth from Judah, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Luke 2, 6 and 7. So it was, while they were there, in the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in the manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. If you guys could be anyone in Bethlehem on the night of Jesus' birth, who would you want to be? Mary, Joseph, an angel, a shepherd, the innkeeper, or just anyone else? I sure wouldn't have wanted to be the innkeeper. He didn't have any room for Jesus. It would have been a wonderful thing to be Mary and to hold little baby Jesus in my arms. I wouldn't mind being Joseph. He took good care of Jesus and Mary, and he followed God's leading. Singing with the angel choir in the sky would have been awesome. Luke 2, 8 through 11. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding by their, in their fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Luke 2, 12 and 13. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was... With the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, goodwill to men. I can see how it would be great to be in the angel choir, but I'd want to be in a shepherd more than anything else. Why? They had a pretty dirty job. Because out of all the people in the world, they were the first ones to know that Jesus was born. They were the first ones to hear the angel choir sing. Yes, and they went to Bethlehem and found a place where Jesus was born. They actually saw him that very night. Not only that, but the Bible also says the shepherds told everybody they saw about the angel's announcement. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. Uh, Luke 2, 18 through 20. And all those things who, no. And all those who have heard it marveled that, <laughs> and all those things who, who've heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. I guess it would have been pretty awesome to be a shepherd. They were the first ones to celebrate Christmas. And when we really understand what Christmas and when we understand what Christmas really means, well, we should never be the same either. That was the very first Christmas. One night in Bethlehem made all the difference in the whole world.
Jesus, born just a baby, became so much more. He became the light and hope in the world for me and you. You know, God would be reconciled to man. Now, the fulfillment of that all, Jesus Christ is the real, true, divinely sent peace offering, which God initiated and sent here into the world. Jesus Christ is that good Samaritan who came and he found one who would have by nature had been at enmity with him and alienated for him. Because when the good Samaritan came upon the wounded man, it was a Jewish person. And one that would have not loved him or probably had done much to help him, 
But he was moved with compassion, and he had the power to do something and chose to do what he could. And he bound up the wounds, and he mollified them with ointment, and he took the man carefully to an end, and he spent of his own expense. He said, now you take care of this person. I'm going, but I'll come back again. When I come back again, I'll square with you anything that you might need to spend over and above to get this person back to 100%. You do it. And that points to what Jesus Christ has done to each of us. Jesus Christ is that good shepherd. He's the one that left the comforts of his home to go out and seek the wayward sheep. That's true love. Let me give you one last thing here, too. Christ's manifestation in the flesh portends a promise to dwell with us forever. You know, some people, they think that, well, the incarnation, yeah, that happened 2,000 years ago, but after that, Christ ascended up to heaven. Things are back to normal now. He's at the right hand of God the Father. So all that, you know being in the flesh stuff and hanging out with mortals, you know, that's all gone now. That's done with. We're back to the normal state of things. After the ascension, everything defaulted back to the way it was. That's not really true. At the moment, we are in an interim period where, you know, this is how Paul explained it. He said, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness or the mystery of the incarnation. God was. He was manifest in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. He was proven righteous by the Spirit, tested in the wilderness, doing everything in perfect submission to the will of God. But then when he went back to heaven, it says that he was preached unto the Gentiles. And right now we're in that time where the word of God and the word of reconciliation is going out. But I'll tell you what. The first advent is an anticipation of another advent. In other words, the incarnation imposed irreversible consequences on the world. It changed things forever and ever and ever. Um, a matter of fact, if you'll turn, if you will, please, to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. I just want to go ahead and show you some things here in the book of Revelation. I'm going to read here in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. And I saw a new heavens and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her, her husband. Right there, that's, a, that's an indication. You know, the, the deist could not possibly have gotten it more wrong. That's why if you go back to the heyday of deism, all the men that ran around and they said, well, we believe in a deistic kind of a creator, Oh, yes, there had to have been a wise one or an all-powerful one that in the beginning kind of kicked things off. But he doesn't manifest much interest in things as they are in the world now. He is kind of like an aloof and an absentee God, one that did his work, and now we're kind of on our own. But the incarnation is an utter refutation of that. The incarnation says that God is very much, he, is so, he so much wants to have a relationship with us that he actually entered into our condition, represented us judicially on the cross so that our lives could be intertwined with his and that we can partake of a single unified thing. And he goes on and he says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. This is wonderful. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, nor shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. You know, I guess I'm just going to close 
with a couple of words. And if you, it, and where those words were found was in my original passage. This is maybe the most important part of my message. This is the part I want to leave you with anyways. The two words, unto us. They put a decision on us. Unto us, a child was born. Unto us, a son was given. You know, that child was born unto us in order that we might be born again. And that son, that divine one, was given unto us that we might be a partaker of his fullness. But there is a difference, people. There is a difference. God choosing to give his son, that's one thing. You or I choosing to receive the son, that's another thing. That's a different thing. I don't know what could possibly be more shocking, more tragic, more scandalous than God having given the great love gift of all love gifts, God having condescended to turn himself into a package and a gift to say, you know what, I'm coming down, I'm going to live with you, I'm going to live with you forever. A theocratic kingdom, the government of which shall be upon my shoulder, and you and your relationship will learn over time to call me names like wonderful and counselor and prince of peace because those when you get when you name me by those names when eternity rolls into view you will simply be announcing the things that i have become to you and i do it willfully and i do it on the back of my own suffering i do it on my initiative when you were running from me and that is a mighty gift and yet the gift is already given But not everyone has received it. You know, it's, a, it's one thing to have a babbling brook full of wonderful water just crashing over the rocks and getting purified and it's so cold and refreshing. It's another thing to actually go and drink. The most important thought that I have to give to you, we live in a world right now, they celebrate at Christmas time everything else about Christ. Don't ask me why. Uh, I mean, I, I believe in family ties. I believe in brotherly love. I believe in goodwill to men. I believe in rituals and traditions, all this kind of stuff. You know, but I tell you what, those things are all vanity except they're anchored upon something that has eternal value. And the one thing about Christmas that we can actually say has eternal value is going to matter in this lifetime and the lifetime to come. It's all about Jesus Christ, okay? That he is the one thing really, truly, honestly, that is worth celebrating at Christmas time. Uh, we, we might enjoy the music and the feasting and all the other stuff that comes with it. But in terms of where our hearts need to go for worship and reception, it is straight to God and to think about what Christmas means. And it means that God gave us his son. And you have to choose to receive him. I did that one at the age of 24. And, and I'm just going to say in closing here that there was a point in time I, you know, I attended a church for a little while as a teenager growing up, and I suppose I would have made an intellectual sort of assent that Jesus Christ was, in fact, the Son of God. And I, and I, and I, I believe that, and I would have said that, but that was a matter of giving assent to doctrine. That was not a matter of me experiencing the reality of my own personal need recognizing who I was before God, taking account of my state and, and coming to him with a view to claiming that promise, giving a wholehearted embrace of him and, it says, and say, Lord, I not only believe it, I see that I need it. And I'm asking you, I want to receive you. You are given, but I have to take, and I would this morning, I would in my life take you to be my personal savior. And people, if you've never done that, that is the most important thing to do in all your life. Do you understand? Because God doesn't give things a gift that great and you, and you can walk away with it and say, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. No, you're not. None of us are. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have for four weeks now, Lord, talked about why you even chose. And it was a choice, Lord. It was an agenda. Part of an unfolding plan in the which, Lord, you had certain aims and aspirations and objectives to attain. And you did this by becoming a human being, fully 100% human, a man. I don't even know how divinity could be crammed inside of humanity. But Lord, I guess I don't even have to understand it. I just have to believe it. You said that you did it. And you did it out of love. And you did it to demonstrate that, and as a matter of fact, the problem is on our side. We are selfish. We might not want to admit it, but the fact of the matter is we are selfish. We prove it to ourselves if we just be honest enough to look at the course of our life at times. But Lord, you loved us anyways. And the gift that you gave was the gift of all gifts. It's the unspeakable gift. I pray, Lord, that we would all receive that gift and claim it, lay claim to it, embrace it, come to you in needful prayer. And we'll give you the thanks and the praise for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen.